In today's lecture, we're going to continue to add new tools to our circuit analysis toolkit. And in particular, uh, I've broken these lectures down into two segments, part A and part B, to discuss circuit theorems. Uh, we'll talk about why these theorems are important, uh, but to give you a summary of what we're going to be discussing in this particular section of the lecture, uh, lecture 12A, uh, they're going to be an introduction to the concept of uh, circuit theorems and why they're needed. We then are going to discuss the definition of linearity and the application to linear circuits that we have uh, considered thus far. Uh, we're then going to look at the idea of superposition principle and uh, when we can use that. Then we're going to look at source transformation and uh, kind of motivate the reasoning for uh, using this technique. Uh, we're then going to look at examples for each case and we're going to uh, take a quiz as usual to reinforce the concepts. And one last point is that you have to make sure that you're pretty comfortable with the prerequisite concepts that are uh, written here. Uh, by doing so, you will get the most out of these lectures. So let's go ahead and talk about, uh, kind of motivate why we're looking into this topic. So the theory we've developed thus far only helps us in solving simple circuits, resistive circuits, uh, circuits with voltage and current sources, both independent and dependent. Uh, but a question we have to ask ourselves is that, is it practical to apply mesh and nodal analysis techniques that we've learned so far to large circuits? Uh, that are that can contain hundreds or thousands of passive and active elements so resistors inductors capacitors transistors diodes and so on and so forth is it really practical to go there and uh, kind of break let's say 20 meshes you know separate 20 different meshes and solve it by hand or even by matrix methods uh, so further Considering that question, we can also ask a follow-up question, which is that what can we add to our circuit analysis toolkit to be able to analyze circuits with increasing complexity? And the reason we're asking this question is that we have to consider that electrical engineers are very interested in simplifying and developing equivalent models for complex circuits. So, in other words, we like to simplify complex circuits and develop equivalent models for them. So from the very beginning we've seen this right so we've seen that if you have a simple resistive network con uh, containing four resistors r1 to r4 uh, we look at terminal behavior so we look at its terminals and consider what is the simplest possible representation of this circuit uh, that can kind of produce the same behavior so what is behavior it's essentially iv characteristics voltage and current characteristics at some particular terminals so in this particular case if I apply a certain voltage, I would get an equivalent, a certain amount of current flowing into those terminals and coming coming back out from terminal B, for example. And if I apply a current source, uh, the current is going to flow through the circuit and develop a certain voltage across uh, terminals A and B. Well, this can be modeled by one single resistor uh, that is a function of all each of these individual resistors. And you can watch the previous lectures again and uh, use those techniques to find these. So using this simple example uh, to show you why we want to do this, I'm trying to prime your mind for uh, kind of appreciating why we need to get into the subject. And so to answer our previous question, it is not practical to uh, have a circuit of let's say 10, 20 meshes or 10, 20 nodes and higher and apply K, uh, apply nodal and mesh analysis to every single node or mesh. It becomes very time consuming and practically speaking nobody you're not going to be able to get anything done uh, efficiently at least at those rates. And so the concept is okay let me look at this simple circuit here that consists of two independent current sources and one voltage source and some resistors and think of its terminal behavior. How does this terminal behave if I give it some voltage or current at those terminals and want to look at output, either current or voltage. So the question then is, similarly to the case above that we've considered many times, can I simplify the circuit into some independent source, voltage or current source, and some independent, some element, resistor or whatnot? Let's keep it general for now. So in other words, can I express kind of look at this as a black box and express its behavior as a function of its internal components in the simplest manner possible. 
So that's kind of the question we need to consider throughout these lectures. So with that uh, being given to us, let's go ahead and consider the idea of linearity while you think of those concepts. So for a linear circuit, the output voltage or current must be a linear combination of the input voltage or current so or the input excitation. So if we consider the same circuit, some circuit here that has some factor that's multiplied by the input, let's say gain or attenuation or whatnot, depending on what the circuit is. Let's just say the system, let's call it system factor or system multiplier. If we give it an excitation Vn1, which is some constant alpha times some input voltage, for example, Vs, then the output's going to be Vo1, which is the system multiplier times the input, in this case alpha Vs. In another scenario, if we apply Vn2, which is beta Vs, we, get, we would expect to get Vout 2 equals the same system multiplier times the second input, beta Vs. Now, in all of these cases, what we basically want to do is we want to prove that uh, if I apply a sum of these scaled inputs, I should be able to get uh, the sum of scaled outputs. So, in other words, if I have Vn3, which is a sum of two input voltages, Vn1 and Vn2, I should be able to see that Vout3 is some linear multiple of these two inputs. That's a very simple concept. And to prove it, you essentially, uh, to look at the actual math, you essentially say, okay, I've defined Vn1, and I know what Vout1 is going to be. I've defined Vn2, and so on and so forth. Now, if I have Vn3, which is the sum of the two inputs, uh, I would express that, I would express what I would expect um, the total input to be, so al alpha Vs plus beta Vs. Then I apply that to the system, and I would get, uh, uh, you would get at the output, a times Vn3. That's what you would expect. Vout3 should be A times Vn3. Now Vn3 is uh, alpha plus beta times Vs. Same thing is here. If I plug that into uh, the the expression for the input, I would have A times alpha plus B times Vs. I can put another parenthesis here to make it clear. And factoring those out, we would get the following result. Now, alpha Vs is simply Vn1, beta Vs is simply Vn2, and so we can simplify the entire expression as uh, Vout3 is equal to A Vn1 plus A Vn2. So this has proven that the system is linear. You can also express this as, you can factor the A out and say Vn1 plus Vn2. So it is very simple to show in these circuits that uh, they are linear. So let's go ahead and look at another kind of concrete example with uh, variables or numbers. Okay, so here we have a very simple example, a simple resistive network. Uh, I've drawn some dotted lines here to indicate that this is a black box system. We want to start thinking about linear systems that way. They're black boxes and you look at their terminals, you apply some excitation current or voltage, and you look at the output and see the effect. So I want to get us to think uh, that way about these systems. So in this case, we're asked to find, prove that the simple resist, resistive network is linear. So given the definition we've seen so far, what we would do is we say, okay, we have some input voltage. I can uh, create two different inputs. Vn1 is equal to alpha Vs. Vn2 is equal to beta Vs. So some factor, uh, 1 volt, 2 volt, 10 volts. You can change the voltage as, it, uh, as the system permits. And we can say that Vn3 is going to be the linear combination of these two of these two inputs, and so uh, we need to show that the output is going to be some system multiplier or some sort of factor times uh, or a linear multiplier times the uh, uh, two inputs that were individually uh, applied to the system. Because Vn1, we expect Vout1 to be A times Vn1, and we expect Vout2 to be A times Vn2. And so let's go ahead and actually apply it to this very simple system. 
So in the first case, uh, we can apply a voltage divider. It's very simple. V out 1 is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2 multiplied by the input, which is alpha Vs. And in the second case, we can apply a different voltage. V out, the output's going to be R2 over R1 plus R2. And this in, in this case, this would be our A, or uh, the system gain or attenuation. The same A here. And the second input is going to be beta Vs. Now, uh, the question is, is VO3 equal to VO1 plus VO2? That's the question. And so, uh, to find that, what we would do is we would apply Vn3, which is simply alpha Vs plus beta Vs. We would apply that to the system. And the question is, when we do that, so let's go ahead and uh, so we know that's going to be the form VN3, oops, VN3, and A is going to be, let me just continue to write everything out, so alpha Vs plus beta Vs. So we know what our system factor is, it's going to be R2 over R1 plus R2, simple voltage divider, and we have our alpha Vs plus beta Vs. And writing all that out, we have alpha Vs R over R2 over R1 plus R2. Okay, so that's our final answer. And just to simplify it a little bit and summarize it, so VO3, we have proven that it is simply A times alpha Vs plus A times uh, beta Vs, which is equal to A Vn1 plus A Vn2. So we have proven that the system is linear. So it's very simple and I would hope that you can get very comfortable with this as we move forward because the next concept is the superposition principle. So the linearity property leads us to one of the consequences of linearity is that uh, the, is the superposition principle. And basically what it is is that if you have n different sources that act on a system, so let's say it's a voltage or current source, when they act on a system to produce a particular effect at the output, uh, that effect can be also found by considering one source at a time and summing the results of each source at the output. So what do I mean by that? So how would you actually apply this to, let's say, this circuit? What you would do is you would turn off all independent voltage and current sources the keyword is independent, and uh, except for one of the sources, so either current or voltage sources that remain, you want to just keep one on at a time. You want to find the output variable, whether it's current or voltage, as a result of that active component, active source, using the nodal or mesh analysis techniques that we've learned and discussed many times. Then we want to repeat that first step for every single remaining independent source. And once we've done that, we can then calculate the output variable by summing the individual contributions of each independent source. We're going to look at examples, so don't worry if you don't fully get this yet. Now, a particular note is that we cannot suppress dependent sources. If we suppress them, uh, well, the reason we can't do that is because their contributions depend on independent, uh, independent uh, voltage or current sources. And so if we suppress them, we're not accurately uh, accounting for their effect into the circuit. So th the rule here is that you do not suppress dependent sources. So if you look at this example, you do not suppress this guy. You simply leave this voltage uh, controlled uh, current source, or sorry, current controlled voltage source, you leave this guy be and you do not ever suppress it. You only suppress the independent sources one at a time. So with the output variable being the current in this particular branch, the way I like to express the superposition principle is that the output current is the output current when the current source is off plus the output current when the voltage source is off. And let's let's talk about how do we actually turn these off. So uh, if you need to find IO when I first turn off the uh, 
current source. And the way we do that for current sources is we open them. So we essentially uh, simply break break the connection so that no current can flow such that it's zero. So that's the first case. So once we do this, so let me label that as the first case. We break that particular uh, node. And, in, and we find I out uh, by doing the mesh or nodal analysis techniques in the remainder of the circuit. And in the second case, we zero out this voltage source, but we put back uh, the current source. So the first case, we got this guy out. Now the second case, we zero out the voltage source. The way you do that is you simply short the voltage source out on paper. So you don't do this in real life, you only do it on paper. We short this guy out. And by shorting it, we zero out that voltage across these nodes. Once we do that, this guy simply turns into a just a line, basically. And then we, again, find um, I out, which is this particular I out, uh, by doing mesh or nodal analysis techniques. Okay, so here's another simple example that uh, we're going to apply uh, superposition principle to. So looking at this circuit, we see in the two independent sources and there's an output variable that we need to find. And so if you just take away this independent current source, you have a simple voltage divider. And if you remove uh, this particular voltage source, you have a simple um, uh, current divider. So normally the way you would do this is you would apply KCL. In this particular case, you would simply apply the uh, apply KCL, uh, so this node voltage minus this node voltage VO over that resistor, uh, you know, is equal to 5 amps plus or minus this particular current going into this resistor. So you could do that, but for this simple example, that would work, but as we get to more complex examples, it becomes very cumbersome. So to use the superposition principle, which is what we're asked to do here, uh, we would say, okay, the output variable is V out, so I'm going to need to look for V out, but I'm going to do that when V out, uh, I'm going to find first V out when the, the source voltage is equal to zero. And I'm going to sum that with the V out when the source current is equal to zero. Let's call that IS. So let's go ahead and draw, draw the equivalent uh, circuits for these two cases. So that's case one, that's case two. Let's go ahead and draw that out. Okay, so as you can see, for the first case, as I've defined here, it's V out when Vs is equal to zero. To zero out a voltage source, independent voltage source, we simply short out that voltage source. We take it out, we short uh, what was remaining in its place, and we leave the other source. And we carefully label the output as the V out under that particular condition. So V out when Vs is equal to zero. We look at the second case. We keep the first uh, vo the voltage source intact, and we take out the current source. How do we zero out current sources? We simply remove them uh, because an open circuit causes the current, there causes no current to be flowing and so that's when a zero current condition occurs. And we again carefully label its output. So, so these, these are not V out, these are simply V out under a given imposed condition that we apply to it. So what we do is we simply uh, consider these two cases, apply superposition to it. So the first case, uh, let's look at it. What would the output voltage be? Well, we know when this current flows, the five amps flows up here. It would only, it can only go through these two resistors, and we can, we can simply, for the first resistor, which is, uh, which V out develops across it, we are given the polarity, the passive sign convention, and so this polarity assumes that the current flows uh, down to R two, and I'm simply going to do the same sort of logical. Uh, assumption here and assume that the current is going to flow here and it cause a voltage drop and uh, so let's do that for the first case so uh, let's consider what happens we have this current flowing through both uh, uh, elements and we need to find V out so what I can do is I can use current divider so I can say that V out is equal to uh, 5 amps now recall that current divider is slightly different from the voltage divider if you have two resistors like this, uh, for voltage divider, you would say that um, uh, the output voltage gets divided down by the ratio of R2 over R1 plus R2. But for current divider, 
uh, it's the the other resistor comes up top. So what does that mean? If you think about this intuitively, we're saying how much voltage develops across R2. Well, that depends on how large R1 is. If R1 is very large, uh, most of the current flows through uh, uh, this resistor R2 because current, if you want to think about it simplistically right now, at this level, current follows a path of least resistance. And so uh, imagine R1 being being, uh, uh, being an open circuit, so being infinite resistance or a very large resistance, what you would expect is that most of the current flows through R2. That's what would happen. Let's say R2 is 1 ohm and R1 is... Uh, let's say 100 mega ohms and so you would expect almost 5 amps a very large portion of 5 amps may, maybe 4.99 amps to flow through R2 and so this equation reflects that if R, R1 gets huge uh, let's say let's take the limit as the limit of V out as R1 approaches infinity what would you get you would get 5 amps times uh, let's factor R1 out R1 over R1 multiplied by 1 over 1 plus R2 over R1. Well, if we're taking the limit as R1 approaches infinity, uh, we can fa cancel those guys out. And R1 goes to infinity, this goes to 0, and we get 5 amps, which makes sense. Intuitively and mathematically, we have proven that. And so that's how I think about current divider is that it's the other guy's resistance. It goes into a numerator. Uh, if you don't like it this way, what you can do is you can simply combine these two resistances. Uh, so let's actually calculate the value first before we do the other method. We simply uh, calculate this 5 amps times 10 over 10 plus 5, which is 15. That is simply 1 third, so that's going to be 5 thirds of an amp. Uh, sorry, 5 thirds of a volt. Always check your dimensions. So we have uh, 10 over 10. Um, let's see here. Sorry, so it looks like I'm forgetting something. So I'm forgetting to, uh, once I found this current, I'm forgetting to multiply that by the resistor value. So I forgot to add, multiply by the resistor value times R2. So I hope that didn't confuse you. So the current divider simply tells us how much current is in the... Uh, so what I should really be saying is that the current through... The current through this branch is going to be uh, 5 amps times R1 over R1 plus R2. So that's only the current. It's getting divided down by a factor. And the voltage then, V out, is going to be that current multiplied by, the, by that resistance. And so you can see here uh, what we have done. So let's kind of log that out. Uh, and hopefully this makes sense to you. So the limit, so if R1 was... An open circuit um, and let's say R2 remained 5 ohms V out would become 5 times 5 25 volts this makes sense so now but now it's getting divided down because R1 is a finite value so some current is going to be stolen in the other direction so not all the current is going to go through R2 and so the 5 amps is going to get divided down by uh, this factor of uh, one third, but then it's going to have to be multiplied by uh, the 5 ohm resistor to become the uh, output voltage. And so what this does is you can cancel these out, and uh, you would still get, let's see, am I doing this correctly? By one third, uh, 50 over 3 now. So 50 over 3 volts and so that's the first case and in the second case uh, let's see here in the second case and actually we found a value here so what I was going to uh, consider here is that the other method for doing this is that you could simply turn this into an equivalent resistance so you could turn this into uh, the equivalent of uh, R1 and R2 which is um, somewhere in between 5 and 10. So uh, you could say R equivalent is equal to 5 times 10 over 5 plus 10. So that's 50 over 15. And what you could do then is you could have the current, all the 5 amps, 
flow through this one resistor that's equivalent and what you would get is that um, and the problem with that is if you do that let's see no, that should be the same okay because V out these are in parallel and so the V out across this guy is the same as the V out across the other guy and so you can do this easily so the V out is going to be V out is going to be um, R equivalent times the 5 amps which is 50 over 15 times the 5 amps these cancel you get 50 over thirds 50 thirds volt let's take that out this got really messy I apologize but I hope you get the concept these are the same with two different methods so looking at the second uh, section of this superposition problem we have to then uh, simply apply a voltage divider and so let's still correct one more thing so this is V out when the voltage source is equal to zero so let's keep that in mind so then we find V out when the current source is equal to zero and you can see I've taken it out here and we can simply do a voltage divider and that is uh, let's just say this V out when that is the case it would be Vs times R2 over R1 plus R2 which is 10 volts times 5 over 5 plus 10 which is uh, 50 over 15 volts you can simplify that a bit factor of 5 out you get and factor of 5 out here you get 10 over 3 let's see 5 5 right 10 over 3 volts and so the final answer then is uh, that the output voltage is equal to uh, the first case plus the second case so you have 50 over 3 plus 10 over 3 which is equal to 60 over 3 which is equal to 20 volts V out is equal to 20 volts using the superposition principle let's go ahead and verify this with LT spice Okay, so you can see the circuit here, a very simple circuit. I've labeled this node V out and I'm running a simple DC operating point. And I'm going to run it, look at V out, and I see 20 volts as expected. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the idea of source transformation. As you recall, linearity is the backbone of uh, the superposition principle. And uh, the principle of equivalence between uh, terminals so equivalent behavior between one circuit and another uh, at its terminals is the backbone of source transformation and so let's talk about the reason why you might want to actually do a source transformation so uh, if you keep in mind linearity and equivalence uh, you're able to transform a voltage source into a current source and vice versa uh, there are two conditions that you must follow to be able to do this so the first one is that uh, the voltage and current sources cannot be ideal and we'll see why that is so they have to be practical sources with some loss and recall that losses are usually modeled by resistors and the second condition is that the polarities must be considered carefully so uh, you definitely have to pay attention to uh, the polarities of the voltage source or the direction of the current flow so before we get into that, let's go ahead and look at uh, a practical voltage source and a practical current source. So a practical voltage source, uh, if we call the ideal one, an ideal voltage source would simply look like this. It would have just your positive and negative terminals, and then they would go into, uh, you would basically measure them at terminals A and B, and it would give you exactly your uh, desired voltage no matter what the load is so as you increase or decrease RL if you short it if you set RL to zero uh, of course it's going to be zero here the output but besides that uh, essentially uh, you will always get VS across RL and you get the desired current by Ohm's law but in the real world uh, your uh, batteries for example have internal resistances internal losses whether that's from uh, you know if the finite conductivity of the conductor connecting the terminals or 
just any other parasitic resistance inside could give you this uh, sourced resistance that is modeled by, by one single resistor here. And essentially what this is going to do is create a voltage divider between your battery or voltage source and the uh, load. And so uh, what would you expect from that? What you would expect is that uh, if you start with a short circuit at the output, you would start with zero volts, of course. And you can look at the equation here with the voltage divider, and you can see if RL is equal to zero, you get zero volts at the output. As you increase RL, uh, if you take it to infinity, you would get, at the limit, you would get a one over one, one over one ratio. And so at the, at an open circuit for RL, you would get VS. And that makes sense because you would have no current flow with an open circuit at the output, and there's therefore there's no voltage drop at RS. But in reality, you never really, we never really want to just keep such circuits open. We want to use them across a load. And so, uh, this, 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 uh, the practical voltages in their resistance then, uh, the parasitic resistance kind of uh, degrade the performance. And so if you look at a, a current source, a practical current source is going to have a, a parallel element here that is uh, also some finite resistance. And how would it behave if you have a short circuit? Well, the entire current is going to uh, essentially short this resistor and appear uh, at the output. And so you can see in the graph here, at zero, uh, zero, a short load, you would get IS. And of course, as RL goes to infinity, it becomes an open circuit. None of the output current shows up uh, at the output, and all of it goes through that. It basically burns up inside that uh, sort of current source. And you can see that here. So there's kind of a reciprocal, uh, somewhat of a reciprocal relationship or inverse relationship between these two different sources. And so, source tra so given that background, source transformation is basically the idea that uh, if you have a voltage source and a resistor in series with it, you can turn that into a, a current source with a resistor in parallel with it. And the way you relate them is that uh, if I start with the voltage source, uh, the current source value becomes uh, Vs over R. And of course, pay attention to the directions. So your plus and minus go in this way and your current will go uh, upwards here. You'll of course have the same resistor in both cases. And now if you start with the current source and go to the voltage source, you would then get, so if I started here instead with some IS is equal to, let's say, one or two amps, for example, what you would have is that I would pay attention to the polarity and place the same resistor here. And then I would simply do I times R by Ohm's law. So V would be, for example, two amps times R, and that would be the voltage you would need to supply to uh, get a desired voltage. So let's check, um, kind of conceptually, let's check what that means and how does that make sense. So we can see here that uh, whatever the current is, if you have some sort of a load here, whatever the current is flowing uh, uh, in the circuit, uh, there's going to be some voltage drop across that resistor. And uh, if, you, if you don't have a load and you simply have, let's see, you simply have this Vs over R here. We can see that if there's no load uh, across this, uh, these terminals, you would have the entire IS flowing through this resistor R. And we can find the output voltage in that way. And so the output voltage would be IS, which is Vs over R, multiplied by R, and that would simply be Vs. So you can see that in an open circuit condition, this is exactly the same thing as uh, this original circuit in the open circuit condition. Because if there's no current flowing uh, in this direction, the entire voltage would appear here. Because there would be no voltage drop as a result of current flowing through R. And so these are the basics of source transformation. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example here. A prominent example. So. Uh, if you're asked to find the output current here by source transformation only, so we can't do any other uh, techniques. So go ahead and pause the video and uh, try this yourself and then watch me do it. Okay, so assuming that you've tried it for yourself, let's go ahead and actually solve this. So 
I know I'd like to find the current through this branch and so I'm just gonna leave that branch alone and I'm, I am gonna note that uh, the assumption here is this particular polarity because of that current flow and so I'm just gonna leave that branch alone and just work on everything else so let's think here I see a current source I'm gonna think about where its current would potentially be going the current could be going this way this way this way and elsewhere of course let's think about it would it change anything would the IV characteristics change at, at this at these terminals if I swap these guys around the resistors and the uh, current source would any of that change well if you think about it no because uh, if you disconnect everything here and you swap these guys around they will still the currents will move in whichever way they should because all of these terminals are in all these elements are in parallel and so whatever that voltage is let's call it V A for example depending on how this current flows when it's unconnected here uh, it is going to be what it is no matter where you put any one of these elements and so given that and by combining these guys together because they're in series we can go ahead and simplify uh, these segments of the circuit so I'm going to source transform these sections okay so once again what I did is that I uh, moved the current source here to the very left and moved the 10 ohm resistor to the right to be able to clearly see that I'm gonna have a uh, 2 amp source 2 amp source going to these resistors to the 10 ohm and the 5 ohm then I simply combined the 10 and the 5 to get roughly 3.33 ohms here now the way we do source transformation is we check the direction of the current or voltage uh, polarity and in this case it's going up so I know my voltage source is going to have a typical positive negative in this fashion then I multiply the current times the uh, equivalent resistance per ohms law and that is 2 times 3.33 which is about 6.66 or so repeating but we're going to round that uh, kind of down of course and stop it somewhere um, and so that is what we have we keep the same resistor as the equivalent resistance here in series with the uh, voltage source and now we have the values and we keep this guy the same we don't change this guy because we need that current and I do the same thing here I find uh, 5 ohms here uh, move it kind of to the other side so that I can source transform the 5 amp current in those guys and I get uh, 5 times 5 which is 25 volts per ohms law and I keep the same resistance the 5 ohms and now basically what we need to do is get everything to be a single mesh so that um, actually we're not gonna do a mesh because we can't change this guy and so what we can then do is uh, move this guy back here and the reason we can do that is that uh, if you think about it and if you're writing the mesh equation for this first mesh only think about what you would see as you go up you would go up and see a negative 6.66 volts or so roughly then if I assign this polarity here I would see uh, uh, positive 3.33i then I would see a negative 10 here let's ignore everything else because it doesn't change for this particular step and so it's going to be dot 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 equals zero whatever it may be if you think about it if I take the 10 volts here and move it the 10 volt source and put it here let's let's see if anything changes would the current change well no because uh, we know that all series elements share the same current and so I can swap all of these guys around and nothing should change in terms of current so the mesh current should stay the same now what about potentials the voltages in the loop would that change well let's think about it if I put this guy here I would see the neg this source first and the next source and then the resistor what would that do well I would see a negative 6.66 then I would see a 10 volts then I would see the current or the resistance value the voltage cross resistor and then that's it so nothing has changed here I've only changed the order of operations for uh, uh, the order of uh, basically addition and subtraction so that's kind of my small proof and mini proof for you that uh, the reason you can do that. 
you can move the source around. Okay, so in this case, I've gone ahead and moved the 10 volt source to the very left of the resistor. Then I've combined the voltages because you can do that. Uh, if you recall the mesh equation again, you would see a negative. Hold on one sec. You would see the negative 6.66 as you go up. Then you would see the moved voltage, which is negative 10. Now I can simply just combine the two and get a negative 16.66 as I go up from the bottom. And so that's what I've done here. The math kind of shows you that uh, conservation of energy is still apl uh, applied here and it's not violated. And so continuing forward now, because we can't move this guy, we can't really change it much if you want to keep things convenient. What we can do is do another source transformation here and get everything to be in terms of uh, current sources. If we do that, we get the following circuit. Okay, so having simplified this circuit uh, by doing two source transformations once more, we can turn this into a current source in parallel with the resistance and paying attention to the direction of the voltage source. Uh, plus or minus in this fashion would give you a uh, um, current flowing in the upwards direction. Now, of course, using Ohm's law, you would expect the current to be V over R. And so, of course, the resistance remains the same, 3.33. The, volt, the current through that uh, current source will be the voltage divided by the resistance and that's roughly 5 amps here and we have the voltage divided by the resistance once more that's about 5 amps and now we can essentially combine these two current sources because all they're doing and how they're affecting the circuit is that they're pushing 5 amps from both directions and that current is going to split in some fashion between all of these resistors so we are basically uh, going to combine them and a small proof for why that's okay is that uh, this is all the same node and so uh, you can imagine that if, if this whole thing is this whole thing is the same node so we can call it VX and you have 5 amps going this way, 5 amps going in this direction. And so if I simply move this guy to the very left here, near the other uh, source, or vice versa, I've n I haven't really done anything differently. I'm still... Let, let me simplify this once more. So I have some node here, Vx. Right now I have 5 amps flowing this way, 5 amps, five amps flowing this way, and some mystery current, which really the sum should be 10 amps and if things are going in the right direction if the assumption is correct for the direction and uh, if that is the case that would be 10 amps now let's think about it if I simply move this source to the other side I would simply have 5 amps there 5 amps there going into that same node and I would still have 10 amps going through that node and so you can see that nothing has changed so I'll go ahead and do that and I will also combine these resistances, the 5 and the 3.3, 3.33 in parallel, but keep this guy the same and you'll see why I'm doing that. Okay, so I have combined the two current sources by the logic uh, I just mentioned and explained and I've also combined these two resistors in parallel to get roughly 2 ohms and so voila, you can see that the, simple, uh, the circuit is very simple. All, all we have to do is do a simple current divider and if you recall the current through this branch IO is simply going to be the source current 10 amps multiplied by some resistive ratio uh, it's not like the voltage divider is slightly different uh, so the current going through this resistor is is uh, proportional to the current uh, or the resistance of the other path other paths in the uh, uh, resistive uh, let me rephrase that. So the current going through a given resistance in parallel with other resistors is going to be proportional to the resistance of other uh, resistors, basically. So, and I've explained that in uh, a few minutes ago why that is, uh, with the current taking the path of least, least resistance. And so uh, the other resistor is 2 ohms, and if you sum those up, 2 plus 5, you would have 10 times 2 over 7, which is... 20 over 7 and that gives us an output current of roughly 
2.86 amps. And what we're going to do is go ahead and use LT Spice to verify this very quickly. Okay, so we have the original circuit right here, and I have the current directions being the negative of uh, negative two times. Uh, let's see here, did I do it correctly? Right, so uh, they're, they're going up here, and so if you do a negative for uh, a downgoing current, uh, it should be the same. And let's get it back again. And let's run the DC operating point simulation. And if you look at the res uh, current through R3, which is a 5 ohm, 5 ohm resistor, you would see 2.85, which is very close to our answer, and so we've done it correctly. Uh, now let's go ahead and move on to the quiz. Alright, so now we have gotten, gotten to the quiz portion. And in, for the first question, we're asked to find uh, the output voltage in terms of, uh, or by using the superposition principle. Just remember the principle and uh, write it down carefully and go step by step as we always do in circuit analysis. And for problem two, we're asked to find the output voltage also, but using source transformation only. So uh, pay attention to signs and best of luck. So I'll allow you to pause the video and give these two problems a try. Okay, so assuming that you've tried these problems, I'm going to go ahead and solve number one. So we are asked to use superposition. So uh, what I'm going to do is first write out uh, what this solution should consist of. So the first thing to note is that we have three different independent sources. And by superposition, we have to turn everything off except for one source at a time. And so we know there's going to be three different combinations of uh, scenarios. And so the first case, we could say the order really doesn't matter because they're summing. We're going to sum the solutions at the end. So the first case we could say is when, uh, let's say when the current sources are all zeroed out. So IS1 is equal to IS2 is equal to zero. So that's the very first case. The second case we could say is when uh, VS is equal to zero. Sorry, let's do it differently. Vs is equal to Is1 is equal to zero. And the third case is when uh, Vs is equal to Is2 is equal to zero. So let's think about it. At any given time, we're crossing out. So for the first case, we're crossing out. Uh, the current sources, let's write these out case by case. First we cross these guys out, keep one on, then we cross out the voltage in one of the one of these guys, current sources, then we cross out this guy and this guy, so that makes sense. So I'm going to go ahead and pause and uh, write down the circuits, the simplified circuits. Okay, so we have the simplified circuit for the uh, first case. Now I could make one more simplification. Um, uh, before doing that, let's talk about what I did. So I simply opened the current sources, and by doing that, they just do not inject any current into the circuit. So you can just pretty much ignore them, cross them out, and you get this circuit here, simplified circuit. Now, uh, I can just combine a single step and just make these 15 ohms by adding them, because they're in series. Then I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, take the parallel combination of 15. So let's just say that. Let me just go ahead and clean this up and call it 15. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and take the parallel combination of 10 and 15. Uh, I'm not going to write it out multiple times because we have really low space. So, okay, so having simplified all the resistances, we can see that uh, we have a simple voltage divider now. And so this particular output is going to be the source, which is 10 volts, times 2 over 2 plus 6, which is 10 times 2 over 8 which is 10 over 4, that is roughly 2.5, or it actually is just 2.5 volts. So what we just found is the effect of only the voltage source at the output. Now we're going to go ahead and do the simplification for the current sources, so case 2 where we short VS and open IS1. 
Okay, so once you short, once you uh, short VS and open IS1, uh, you essentially get the circuit down here. Now it's your choice how you want to solve this. You could either do source transformation or some sort of uh, Y delta transformation. I chose to do a, uh, a delta to Y transformation here, uh, just to kind of bring back those ideas and uh, kind of make it more complicated because I'm sure you can choose the easy way out but I'd like to do it more complicated so you get more practice so by doing the delta to y transformation from lecture 8 um, if you don't recall them I recommend you to go watch them but what I'm doing here I, I see a delta here immediately because you can imagine that's a resistor here So we have a 5, a 10, and a 10, and of course you have the rest of the circuit. That's one thing you need to do as an electrical engineer is to be able to see these very quickly. To kind of recognize the pattern. So you can see I can just kind of move the branches around and get this to look like a delta. And so I want to turn this into a, uh, uh, from a delta to a Y. So the Y would look something like this. And I'd want to convert these and I've gone ahead and done the conversion if you recall it was basically this resistor is going to be uh, the multiplication of the adjacent resistors in the delta configuration divided by the sum of all the delta resistors so in this case it would be 5 times 10 over uh, 10 plus 5 plus 10 which is 25 so 50 over 25 is 2 you can see that here and uh, for this resistor it would be 10 times 10 over 25 that's 100 over 25 which is 4 and so on and so forth so I've gone ahead and done that and uh, once you do that you see a current source going up here uh, to this particular node I'm going to call that VX and I'm going to do a simple KCL so I'm going to say that's the current going there going there and going there these currents and if I do one KCL equation I get that uh, uh, now this is V out when VS equal to zero go to IS1 so the first equation I have VX let's see here I have 2 amps is equal to because that is the current going into that node and these guys are leaving the currents are leaving there so I have 2 amps going in VX over 2 ohms leaving plus VX over 4 plus 2 because uh, that entire node the entire branch is 6 ohms so what we get is that that's 2 amps is equal to uh, let's find the common denominator we have uh, let's see multiply by 3 here we get 4 over 6 VX let's see if that's correct right that should be right that should be 4 over 6 which is just 2 thirds uh, we can cancel the 2 out so if that's 2 thirds cancel these 2's and we have that uh, VX is equal to 3 3 volts now for the second equation uh, we can see that V out is whatever the current is in that entire branch so VX over 6 ohms that's going to be the current going there multiplied by that resistance 2 ohms so that is VX which is 3 volts over 6 times 2 that's one third times three that's one volt so the contribution from that particular current source is going to be one volt at the output let's go ahead and do case number three okay so for the final case uh, I hope you can see the circuit I'm really running out of room here but for the final case we have shorted out this voltage source and we've opened up that second current source IS2 so now we have this circuit so what I'm going to do is basically uh, if you recall from before I'm going to just move this resistor the 10 ohm I'm going to move it and bring it down here in parallel with the 5 and the 10 I'm going to combine the 5 and the 10 to get 15 once I do that I have basically a, a 15 and a 10 in parallel then I have a current source then all of those are going to go like so so I'm going to have the 10 and the 15 I'm going to combine them and I'm going to get a 6 in parallel which is this guy so I have, a f I have the 4 amps going uh, like so so if you don't recall why we can do this just go back to the previous examples um, uh, 
these are equivalent because the KCL does not change. This current still has to go to that node. And if you move it around, it, the current still travels and goes into that node. So there's no problem doing this. And once you do that, then you can source transform this particular uh, current and resistor pair. Remember that the resistor remains the same, 6 ohms. The, the voltage becomes uh, 6 times 4, which is 24. And just remember that you can drag this guy, kind of bring it down here, but keep keep track of the signs. You get a minus and a plus in this manner. You can do a voltage divider. It's kind of funky looking. It's kind of uh, on its side, but that's no problem. Uh, basically, uh, so n so negative V out is going to be uh, 24 volts times 2 ohms over 6 plus 2. And so V out, and this is the V out under the special condition, let's say condition 3, to make it easier to write. So V out under condition 3 is going to be 2 over 8, which is 1 fourth times 24, but it's going to be negative. So negative, uh, what is that, 1 one fourth times that, that's going to be 6, right? So negative 6 volts. And to summarize everything, V out is going to be the sum of all three conditions. So it's going to be 2.5 plus 1, which is 3.5, minus 6. So what we're going to have is, so what I'm doing is basically just summing all the final answers. Where is this other guy? That's 1 volt, that's negative 6. So... 3.5 minus 6, you're going to get negative 2.5. We're going to verify this shortly. Okay, so here we see the LTSPY simulation. You can verify that everything is correctly placed here. 10 volts, negative 2 amps going down, which is 2 amps going up. Uh, label V out is what we're going to look for. And let's go ahead and run the simulation. You can see that V out is indeed negative 2.5 volts going down here we get negative 2.5 volts so that was done correctly now I'm going to go ahead and solve problem 2 I hope that you've given it a try so we're going to use source transformation to uh, solve this problem so uh, let's see what we're going to do here uh, so looking at this I know that I'm essentially going to have at the very minimum I'm going to have three different source transformations in one step so let's go ahead and do that keeping close attention to the signs okay so essentially what I've done is I've taken uh, I've kind of noted the direction of each current source and performed a simple source transformation so if I look here for the first case I have four amps going into, I kind of just isolate them and think of these terminals uh, by themselves, so A and B for example. I have two ohms here. I think what is that equal to? So the current is going this way, and so I'm going to have a voltage drop looking like that. And when I measure the voltage with some probes at these terminals, I would see a voltage in that uh, fashion. So I would have the same polarity as you saw here. Uh, I'm going to have 4 amps times 2 ohms, which is 8 volts. Then I'm going to have 2 ohms in series. And that's what you see on this end. I've simplified the circuit to uh, what you can see down here. Similarly for this guy, you would have 3 amps. You have to always, in electrical engineering, you have to isolate things and do divide and conquer. Don't get too worried about the big picture, just do small steps. So that is equal to, I see again the current's going this way, so my voltage drop is this way. And so that is equivalent to a voltage source that is in this direction. That is 3 amps times 10 ohms, which is 30 volts, and the same resistor. And let's see, that is what we have indeed over here. Now lastly I have 5 ohms, 5 amps, all I care about is what's going on between these two terminals, the current's going this way, voltage drops this way, I have that 
being equivalent to plus minus. That's a 5 ohm. 5 times 5 is 25 volts. That is a direction that you can see here. So everything else remains the same. Now we're going to do... Uh, so what you might notice is that for source transformation, you essentially either want to get everything down to a single mesh, like so, or you want to get everything down to a single node so that uh, things are simplified uh, a lot. And whether you want to get a singular mesh or a singular node depends on what kind of issue you have, what kind of uh, problem is given to you. So in this case, I have a, uh, I had, when I looked at this, I saw that I have a resistor here and a voltage. So I know I'm going to need some sort of a mesh uh, analysis because I need to find a voltage drop across it. And it's in series with this voltage source, so I'm thinking meshes are probably more appropriate. And so I want to turn everything such that I get a mesh. And by doing a source transformation for these current sources, I get voltage sources in series with resistors, and I can get a singular mesh. Now, if I go further, recall that for a given mesh, uh, the order of the voltages don't matter, so long as you keep the signs, uh, you, you keep track of the signs and do it carefully. So if you look here, you would see that uh, I can assign a current flow direction, a mesh current flow, and I just make sure that everything is kept uh, in track. So uh, looking at here, I just start at the negative 30 and go up. So I see negative 30. I'm only looking at the voltage sources. I see a negative 30, negative 25, negative 20 plus 8. So I think to myself, okay, that's negative 30 minus 25 minus 20 plus 8 and that gives me a negative 67 but I'm going to recall the direction of the current so the current's going clockwise so I know when I hit a negative um, uh, it's going to have their orientation as below so I'm still kind of following uh, the clockwise current I follow the clockwise current and hit a negative and that's the orientation in which my negative 67 should be so the negative simply means where my clockwise current uh, which polarity it meets first. So it meets a negative in this way, so it should be uh, in the same direction as the current. That's all that means. I do that, then I combine all the resistors because I know that they share the same current. And so we're exploiting these properties of circuits, the very basic properties of series and parallel circuits. And that's why you have to really master the fundamentals. That's the purpose of this, is that you have to be very comfortable and be able to just quickly use these building blocks and uh, fundamental concepts. So I combine the 10 and the 5 and the 2 and I get a 17 but I don't touch the 1 ohm because I know I need to find a V out across it. So the next thing I do is that okay now that I have a single very simple mesh I basically say okay my uh, V out I know it's going to be negative because the, the mesh current flow is, uh, is going clockwise but it's going against the passive sign convention so I already know I'm going to have a negative sign. So negative 1 times um, the voltage over the total resistance so volt over resistance times that particular resistor that it's passing through with the negative sign so that is uh, the final answer ohms cancel out and we get that V out is equal to 67 over 18 which is roughly 3.722 so V out is roughly 3.72 volts now let's go ahead and use LT spice to verify this result so here's the original circuit let's go up here and compare side by side you can see that everything's the same but the ground I've selected it to be here that is not a problem uh, with the ground being put at this node then uh, this node is ground and so Vx is going to tell us the voltage drop uh, across the 1 ohm resistor so if we press run we see that the fourth resistor R4 is going to see 3.722 volts and that is indeed uh, what we calculated now the sign is uh, incorrect but that is again because of uh, the way that resistors are defined in uh, net lists and so they're kind of defined as if you recall from the earlier lectures I believe lecture 6a or b uh, 
when we talked about LT Spice and Netlist, we see that resistors are defined as the end point and then the initial point, and so the negative sign has to do with that in this case. Okay, so good job for following along, and I hope that you've uh, gotten something out of this lecture. I will see you in the next lecture.